Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Aaron. I'm a junior doctor working in London. And in this video, I'm going to talk you through how you can take a focused abdominal history. And then we're going to look at four possible cases that could come up in your abdominal history station in your OSCE and how we could go about presenting those histories. If you've got your finals coming up very soon and you want to jump straight to the cases, then please feel free to go for it. Anyway, let's jump straight into it and have a look at the eight step approach that I use to take any history and try and tailor that to a specific abdominal history. So step one is initiate the session and this involves three things. You first introduce yourself, confirm you have the correct patient and start to build that doctor patient rapport. So hi there, my name is Aaron Kiru. Is it Mr. Smith? Okay, Mr. Smith, I understand you've come in with some tummy pain. First of all, I'm really sorry to hear that. I've asked for some painkillers that are on their way. Is it okay if we carry on with some questions? I think just starting with some pain relief, it's really nice for a patient or even if you've got an actor, it straight away gets them on your side. Okay, step two, screen for symptoms. So this is where you're trying to elicit, apart from your main symptom, in this case, tummy pain, are there any other major symptoms that this patient has been experiencing? So. So you mentioned tummy pain, have you noticed anything else? Okay, that's tummy pain, diarrhea, anything else at all? And the whole point here is to try and identify or split that history into different big symptoms and then you can go and tackle them individually. Okay, so step three of your history is gathering information. So this is where you take each of those symptoms individually. You start with a very open question, so tell me about your abdominal pain, and then you basically listen. Listen, 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 as a patient gives you lots of information, and then you narrow down with your focused and closed questions. So with something like abdominal pain, the focus questions are very straightforward. You've just used the mnemonic Socrates. So S stands for sight, so where exactly is the tummy pain? O stands for onset, so does the pain come on gradually or suddenly? C stands for character, so can you describe the character of the pain? So for example, if they mention a kind of intermittent squeezing type pain, you're thinking more colicky pain, so like renal colic or bowel colic. Um, R stands for radiation, so does the pain move anywhere? So for example, if they say the pain moves towards the back, you're thinking potentially AAA, so abdominal aortic aneurysm, or maybe pancreas pathology. If they mention that the pain moves towards a shoulder, then you're thinking, could this be a Murphy sign for cholecystitis? So A stands for any associated symptoms. So when the pain comes on, do you notice anything else at the same time? T stands for time. So how long does the pain last for when it comes on? E stands for exacerbating or relieving factors. So does anything in particular make the pain worse? Does anything make the pain better? So for example, if the pain was to get worse on inspiration, you'd be thinking, could this be kind of Murphy's sign for acute cholecystitis? If the pain was to get worse when you're eating food, this would be more kind of keeping in line with a peptic ulcer. If it was to actually get better with food, you'd be thinking, could this be a duodenal ulcer? And then finally, S stands for severity. So on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst pain, how would you rate the pain? Okay, so step four is summarize. So examiners absolutely love to see students summarize. And I think this is a perfect point. You've just got kind of loads of information. So now's the right time to summarize. So just to summarize, you've mentioned that you've had this abdominal pain for three days. It seems to kind of get worse when you're eating food, especially kind of high fats or high oily foods. And you also mentioned that you've had this diarrhea for the last two days. Is that correct? Okay, so on to step five of your history, which is risk factors. Um, this is a part of the history that personally, I always used to kind of miss out, which is why I've given it its own section. The point of this part of the history is to really help you narrow down your differential and examiners can really see what you're doing here rather than just kind of blindly asking vague abdominal questions. So with any abdominal history, there's kind of one group of risk factor questions that I always ask, which is the liver questions, because I always used to miss them out. And there's three questions I ask, which is, have you noticed your skin turning yellow at all? Have you noticed any change in the color of your urine? Have you noticed any change in the color of your stools? Okay, so on to step six, which is your systems review. And this is where I want you to do a very body system focused review of symptoms. Anything that you may have missed in your screen, you'll catch now. So for an abdominal kind of systems review, I like to ask any pain on swallowing, any nausea and vomiting, any indigestion, any change in stools. So for example, any blood in the stools or any kind of change in stool habit and also any problems passing urine, kind of working your way down the abdominal tract. Um, in any kind of body systems review, I also like to tag along with asking about constitutional symptoms. So this is a group of four symptoms that can pretty much affect any body system. So have you noticed any fever, weight loss, 
tiredness or loss of appetite. Okay, so step seven is the patient's perspective. So this is the patient's ideas, concerns, and expectations. So have you got any idea what might be going on? Is there anything in particular you're worried about and what are you hoping for from today? And it's really important to not just clump all of this together right at the end of your history, but rather be dynamic. Put this into your history by picking up on the patient's cues. And then finally, step eight, which is the background history. So that's past medical history, drug history, family history, and social history. Um, it's nice to kind of signpost here to examiner that you're moving on to this part of the history. So I like to ask some background questions now. Are you normally fit and well? Um, any medical problems that you suffer from? So that's it. That's how you can tailor that eight step approach and tailor it for a very focused abdominal history. Um, what's really important and what I really like about this structure is it kind of translates very nicely into a very concise format to present your history findings at the end of your history to your examiner. So I like to present my history the same way every single time. I start with a brief introduction, so the patient's name, age, and occupation. I then go on to mention the patient's main presenting complaint, and this is with all the information I've got from my open and closed questions. I then mention briefly any other symptoms that they mentioned when I screened for other symptoms. I then mentions the patient's perspective, so the ideas, concerns, expectations. Then it comes on to the relevant negative findings, and this is usually from a combination of the risk factor questions as well as the system review questions. And then I finish off with my top differential. If you want to be brave, if you're feeling good, then you can go even further. You can kind of list one or two other differentials that you think are less likely, um, but important to consider. Then you could go back to your top differential and think what would be the most likely cause of this differential. And finally, thinking back to your top differential again, think about what are the known kind of possible complications of this differential, things that you'd want to be aware of, things that you'd want to exclude in your particular patient. So let's go on to the first case now. Okay, so this first case is a history of colorectal cancer. So I had the pleasure of talking to this 67 year old gentleman today, Mr. Smith, who is a retired teacher. He presents today with a two month history of noticing blood in the stools, which he reports is very dark red and mixed in with the stools. He also notes that his stools have sometimes been very dark and very, very smelly compared to normal. Also of note is he does mention he's lost six kilos over the last two months. Um, he mentions that he feels quite constipated compared to normal and he also reports a recent history of tenesmus. Uh, he doesn't smoke but he does drink alcohol roughly once a week. Um, he's not particularly worried about all of this. The main reason why he's here is his wife was worried and told him to come in. My relevant negative findings are that reassuringly he reports no vomiting and no problems passing urine. So putting all of this together my top differential here would be colorectal cancer. Other differentials that are important to consider but probably less likely would be things like colorectal polyps as well as constipation. So regarding the colorectal cancer, I think the history of tenesmus is vital and I think it points more towards a left-sided low-lying tumour. Possible complications of colorectal cancer that are really important to be aware of and things that I'd want to exclude would be toxic megacolon as well as bowel perforation. Okay, so this second case is a case of small bowel obstruction. So I had the pleasure of talking to this 42 year old gentleman today, Mr. Smith, who is a doctor. He reports a three day history of central crampy seven out of 10 abdominal pain. Also of note is he's vomited four times in the last 48 hours, which he says is green fluid. He reports no blood in that vomit. Um, he also reports that he's been unable to pass stool in the last 48 hours, although he is passing gas. And he's also noticed over the last one month, a new lump come up in the groin region. It's not painful and seems to kind of appear and disappear by itself. Uh, he's quite worried about this. Overall, he's worried about potential cancer. His dad had colorectal cancer, which kind of um, is why he's so worried about that. Um, my relevant negative findings are that reassuringly, he reports no weight loss and there's no problems passing urine. So putting all this together, I think my top differential here would be um, a diagnosis of small bowel obstruction. So other differentials that would be lower down on my list would be inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis, as well as gastroenteritis. Thinking about the possible cause of the small bowel obstruction, I think the absence of any recent surgery, um, which would make me think kind of paralytic ileus, plus the kind of presence of, that he mentions of this new lump over the past one month, would make me think this is most likely mechanical small bowel obstruction secondary to a hernia. So this third case is a case of hemorrhoids. 
So I had the pleasure of talking to the six-year-old gentleman, Mr. Smith, who's a teacher. He reports a one-month history of noticing bright red blood, which is painless, on the toilet paper. He also says some of that blood is smeared on the surface of the stool, but not mixed in with the stools. His stools have never been kind of very black or offensive smelling. Um, also of note is he does say he's quite constipated. He normally is, but it seems to have got worse very recently. He's straining quite a lot when trying to pass stool, and he usually only opens his bowels once every other day. He seems to be most worried about potential cancer. My relevant negative findings are that reassuringly, there's been no vomiting, there's no problems passing urine, um, and there's no recent weight loss. So putting all of this together, I think my top differential here would be um, hemorrhoids. I think other differentials that are important to consider, but less likely would be things like an anal fissure or inflammatory bowel disease, or very rare could be colorectal cancer. Regarding the possible cause of the hemorrhoids, the absence of any obvious history of portal hypertension or any history that would suggest an abdominal tumor, plus the very strong history of constipation and straining would make me think most likely hemorrhoids secondary to constipation and straining. Possible complications of hemorrhoids I'd want to exclude would be things like ulceration and thrombosis. And the final case is a case of appendicitis, which is kind of really common even as a junior doctor. So hopefully this is quite useful, not just for your exams. So I had the pleasure of talking to this 19 year old girl, uh, Jane Smith, who is a student. She reports a six hour history of nine out of 10 central abdominal pain, which has radiated to the right iliac fossa. Also of note is she's had one episode of vomiting. There's been no blood in that vomit. Um, and she does say that she uses an oral contraceptive pill, but is quite irregular with it. She seems to be most worried that she could be pregnant because of her irregular OCP use. My relevant negative findings are that reassuringly there's been no weight loss and no problems passing urine. So putting all this together, I think my top differential here would be appendicitis. Other differentials that are less likely but important to consider could be kind of medical abdominal things such as gastroenteritis, surgical abdominal causes such as diverticulitis or cholecystitis, as well as kind of ovarian or gynae pathology such as uh, ovarian torsion, an ovarian cyst or a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Complications of appendicitis that are important to be aware of and exclude could include an appendiceal abscess as well as perforation. Okay, so there you go guys. Uh, that's been a really content heavy video, so apologies. We've gone over two things. In the first half, we've talked about how we can take a very focused abdominal history using that eight step approach. And then in the second half, we've looked at uh, four really common cases that could come up in your exam. So hopefully putting all of that together, it's quite useful for you guys. If you did find it useful, then please consider dropping a like on this video. Please subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments what worked and what didn't. Also, let me know kind of what other videos would be really helpful for you guys. And I'll try my best to get the content out for you. So thank you so much for watching, guys, and I will see you in the next one.